Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today we're looking at the new Vika Vault Charger Bug deck coming out from Unbroken Bonds. Very unique list here and I've been, you know, tinkering with it for a little bit and it's ended up being something I never thought it would look like but it actually seems really fun and definitely worth looking into. So here's the basic concept. The new Vika Vault has the only attack that can do for three lightning and a colorless it can do 120 and if you choose you can discard all energy attached to it and do an additional 100 so you're either hitting the baseline of 120 which we know is the same as Zoroark or we can jump all the way up to 220 which is you know knocking out the likes of Zoroark and other basic GXs and stage ones and all that stuff so um, really powerful attack on a non-GX and uh, we have this charger bug which has the battery ability that allows you to attach it to a Vika Vault or Vika Vault GX and it counts as two lightning energy cards. So the entire basis of this build is going to be recycling that charger bug as often as you can to chain attacks with your Vika Vault. Now we're playing a very wacky build. I'm playing just one energy card in here. Charger bug is the entire basis of our attacks. So bear that in mind when we go through the list, when you look at the counts that we have, bear in mind that we only play the one super boost energy uh, and we're just playing charger bugs and trying to recycle him as much as possible as our means of attaching energy throughout the entire game. So let's look at those Pokemon. First of all, for Grubbin, there is a new Grubbin. It only has 60 hit points, but it does have a reasonable attack. But again, we only have charger bugs that we can attach. So we're just going for the 70 hit point one. The new charger bug, as I said, has that ability battery. You can attach it from your hand to one of your Vikavolt or Vikavolt GX in play, and it counts as two lightning energy when attached to any Pokemon. Bear in mind, this could be even a Tapu Koko GX. If you attach it to the Vikavolt in the first place, Koko GX can actually steal that Charger Bug uh, attachment because it says when it's attached to a Pokemon, it provides two lightning. <clears throat> it only has to be attached onto a Vikavolt. It can get moved off, which is relevant, but we're not playing the uh, Tapu Koko in this build. We are just all in on the Vikavolts. We're playing three copies. Uh, we're actually not playing four. It's a very strange line to see of a stage two. You won't see this in any other stage two deck. It's normally like a 4-1-4 four, four or something like that. But Charger Bug, his ability, as I've already said, is vital for the deck. He is our four energy cards, essentially. And then three copies of the Vika Vault. We have a lot of Pokemon recycle in this deck. So three copies, I believe, is fine. It has 150 hit points. It's a lightning type, weak to fighting. It does have the ability Stealth Body. If there's a stadium in play, this Pokemon has no weakness. Um, so we actually play no stadiums in this build ourselves so it's only if the opponent puts a stadium down which a lot of decks do to be fair uh we can you know undo the weakness to fighting which is relevant because we have you know 150 hit points we're pretty tanky and there are some fighting techs out there so if there's a stadium in play we can take full advantage of that but the lightning strike attack as mentioned earlier 120 is the baseline but if we choose to we can discard essentially two charge bugs from ourselves and then we do 100 more damage so 220 really really solid number knocking out a lot of stage one GXs and basic GXs, which is really what we're looking for here to really make the prize trade favorable for us. And uh, Lightning Strike can, you know, two-shot the likes of um, Picarom without uh, discarding as well. So stuff like that's pretty powerful. From there, we're going to have the Meganium Swamper engine to fall back on here. So a 202 line of the Quick Ripening Herb Meganium, uh, allowing us to rare candy essentially once per turn from like Grubbin straight into Vikavolt or Mudkip into Swampert so that we can have a good chain of these stage twos throughout the entire game. And then we have a 2-2 line of the Swampert as well. Being able to power draw back into more Charger Bugs is always going to be a big deal because we're recycling these as much as possible. Finding um, some key item cards that we'll get onto in a moment as well. Recharging those always seems powerful. So there might also be a point if we are able to use enough power draws throughout the game that we can literally just use a Rescue Stretcher put three Charger Bugs back, and then Power Draw like immediately into those Charger Bugs. So there might be a point, similar to how Zora Control gets as thin uh, a deck as possible so that they can um, resource management and trade, we could get towards that to guarantee Charger Bugs with Power Draw as well. So do bear that in mind. Not just general digging and general thinning, it's also building towards that goal of getting to basically no deck left so that we can combine with Stretcher for guaranteed Charger Bugs, which is really cool. And then one copy of Tapu Lele GX, Wonder Tagging, guaranteeing those supporters are always a big deal. We have a large amount of Pokemon and we play Pokecoms in here. So having really good outs for Lele is important so we can get turn one Lilies um, or just, you know, turn two access to rare candy via like Bill's Analysis or 
uh, access to ball search. Uh, so yeah, this Lele is really, really important. Uh, nice one off to have in the list, just so that we can have that little added consistency. As already mentioned, we only play one energy in here, so we have the space. Why not add in the Lele? Onto the items. We actually play no stadium, so it's just all items here, no tools either. So we're playing one copy of Switch to help us move out of, you know, the chunky um, Swamperts or Meganiums if they're going to get trapped. And also if we don't start with a Grubbin, switching into one is going to be nice. Two copies of Rescue Stretcher. Obviously, our Vika Volt's going down and uh, stuff like that is going to be uh, not really a problem, but something that we have to keep on track of the entire game. And uh, obviously, we can reload Charger Bugs as well with this card. We're playing two copies of the new Poker Gear 3.0, allowing us to look at the top seven and find a supporter. So again, just a bit of a consistency help there. Four copies of Lure Ball, which I never thought I would say, um, but that is a clutch card in this deck. It is the main way that, re that we are able to recharge these Charger Bugs. You're able to flip three coins for each heads, put an evolution from a discard pile into your hand. So the entire idea here is that we can grab these Lure Balls, grab back our Charger Bugs and Vika Volts, and chain attacks. So really, really powerful trainer card, to be honest, in this exact situation. So really hilarious. That's why we have only two stretchers, because Lure Ball seems to be the stronger option, which is amazing to say, but that's actually the case here. So this is the way that we are able to chain our attacks. Relying on flips is never great, but three flips is reasonable to try and, you know, get the 1.5. Sometimes you get double Charger Bug immediately. Sometimes you just get one and you have to dig for the other or dig for more lure balls. But we actually have a lot of Pokemon search, as you can see down below. So getting into more Charger Bugs shouldn't actually be that difficult when we play such a high count of these lure balls, which is hilarious and uh, also really cool to see how this deck functions. From there, maxing out copies of all the ball search we can, essentially. Four Nest Ball, four Ultra Ball, four Pokecom, and four Rare Candy. We want to get early, um, what's it called, Chikoritas down, early Grubbins down, early Mudkips down. Uh, having Ultra Ball and Calm obviously giving us good Lele odds on turn one for supporters, as well as again getting into those stage twos. And obviously, we need to find rare candy for Meganium as quickly as possible so we can start using those ripening herbs to guarantee more stage twos from then on, which is pretty sweet overall. Onto the supporters, also a little bit wacky. Playing one copy of Brock's Grit. I think this is better than just playing a third rescue stretcher. This is like the last Hail Mary of getting back your final few Charger Bugs and your final few Vika Volts if we are against like non-GX decks that Brock's Grit may come in clutch. One copy of Gladian. Uh, it's going to be important because we have, you know, only two copies of Meganium and Swamper and they're both really important in the build. So if two of them are prized or two of the basics are prized, we can Gladian them out. Additionally, it's huge to get uh, the Charger Bugs themselves or the super, beast, uh, super Boost out of our prize cards. So Gladian can really help us do that. Couple copies of Guzma for trying to hit into some GX Pokemon when we can. Couple copies of Apricorn Maker. He serves as a reasonable option turn one to grab us Nest Balls. But don't forget, Lure Ball has the word ball in it. So in the mid game, Apricorn Maker can give you six coin flips to try and get back two Charger Bugs to maintain attacks. So Apricorn Maker is actually very good in the mid game. Uh, so he's an awesome supporter to have in this list. Four copies of Bill's Analysis, not quite as guaranteed as Apricorn Maker in the early turns for getting you those Nest Balls, but he can still get you into a lot of ball search just because we play so much. It can get us into rare candies, which is the important thing on turn two. Um, and, you know, he's just extra digging in general, so not a bad turn one supporter in general. And then we have four Lilies, the optimal turn one supporter to get us into that large hand size. It does fall off a little bit later on in the game when we have Swampert, but if everything's going well, it's not really a problem that we can just start um, using Power Draw on these Lilies, start Ultra Balling them away. It's not really an issue because we can let the Bills Analysis and the Apricorn Makers take over the game. I never thought I'd say that, but that's what the case is with this deck, believe it or not. And finally, for energy, that one copy of Super Boost. It's a big payoff when we get Meganium Swampert Vika Volts rolling, and it really does mean that we're less reliant on all those uh, Charger Bugs and recycling them. We can have a turn of using a Brock, get them back into the deck and not need to worry about, you know, getting them all out in one turn. We can, sure, go for some power draws and get close to them, but we can also have that backup Super Boost energy. Even if you're just using it once and discarding it for 220, that's still a huge burst of damage out of nowhere. So a really, really nice um, Prism Star energy card that we can take full advantage of here. So here is the full list. Uh, pause now if you want to. Rub your eyes to make sure that you're actually seeing this. This is pretty crazy. It's really awesome playing 
with decks that actually need no energy cards. It reminds me of old Gyarados from way back when, one of my favourite decks of all time, the Gyarados from Stormfront using Tale Revenge. And trying to build a list in a similar vein to that is always a great challenge and a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, I hope you are enjoying this video so far because there's a lot of creativity involved. On some tech options now. It is all fun and games playing no energy cards, but it could be necessary to add in the likes of a Coco Prism Star, the likes of Thunder Mountain, and the likes of, you know, maybe three or four basic lightning energy uh, to give you that less reliance on the likes of Lurball and Charger Box themselves. For now, I'm actually really happy with Lurball. I think it's fine. Um, there are a couple of downsides with not playing any physical energy cards. It's stuff like having to have the one switch in the deck rather than, like, being able to pay retreat out of Mudkip and Chikorita turn one into Charger Bugs and, like, sort of protect them a little bit better. Um, so you effectively have less, like, switch outs in theory because you're not playing any basic energy just to remove these out of the way. That's a bit of a downside. And let's face it, Thunder Mountain and Coco Prism Star are both insane cards. So um, it's not too bad. I think, you know, it is going to take up, like, six spaces, I would say. I would be pretty uncomfortable with less than, like, four Lightning Energy and then the one Mountain, the one Coco... Uh, but if you do add those into the deck, it might release the pressure on Lure Ball a little bit. So if you're not a fan of flipping all those coins, go down this route. Uh, we're actually playing no damage buffs whatsoever. Obviously, we're a Lightning deck. We could take advantage of the likes of Electro Power and Choice Band. Even Shrine of Punishment, it could help us push towards knocking out tag teams of one hit. To be honest, when you're a non-GX deck, you can actually still efficiently trade just by doing two shots on tag teams anyway. So I don't think it's all that necessary. And this all digs into consistency and... All we want to do is make sure that we can get more charge bugs, man, because we're going to lose too much te uh, too much tempo if we miss attacks altogether. So although these charge bugs, or sorry, uh, although these electro powers and choice bands and shrines, they can push one shots in certain situations. I don't think they're absolutely mandatory. Um, I think we one shot enough things in the format at just two twenty, and I think uh, if we're facing tag team stuff, we don't mind two shotting them for the most part in general. And then, because we are Meganium Swampert based, there's been all sorts of other Stage 2s that have been splashed into the list that you could considering. There's the Vika Vault GX that has Gigatron that can do 60 to each of your opponents to bench Pokemon. That could be a huge swing in the game, especially if you just like high roll into it, like turn 2 or something, um, alongside like the Super Boost or a bunch of Charger Bugs. That would be absolutely insane to completely ruin people. Uh, there's things like Decidueye and Greninja GX, which can, you know, put some extra damage here and there. I think I actually prefer the likes of Greninja GX as being a 101 line than just adding in Electro Powers and Choice Bands, because his Shuriken Flurry can act as one of those damage buffing methods, but also becomes an attacker that you can recycle with Super Boost a lot easier against non-GX decks. So again, we're a lot less pressured on the likes of Rock's Grit and Lure Ball every single turn. Kingdra GX is an interesting one. If Reshizard becomes popular enough, uh, similar to how we've seen it in Archie's builds, you could just super boost and do, go for Hydro Pump for knockouts, uh, which is pretty scary. And also it even comes with a Maelstrom GX attack that can put 40 on things. So again, it's sort of that uh, Choice Band slash Shrine of Punishment slot that you have where you go for an early GX attack with the Kingdra to set up tag teams or set up Stage 2 GXs if they are going to be relevant in the format. Um, the Sidua can do some math fixing. Um, Solgaleo GX gives you effectively more switch outs, which is nice. So maybe you just cut the switch altogether and just have the 101 Solgaleo. So if you're expecting stall, we only play two Guzma and one switch. So we are a little bit worried about stuff getting trapped. If you have the Solgaleo, you are no longer worried about that. And you also have the Sunsteel Strike, which is, you know, uh, 10 more damage than the Vika Vault. Um, and, you know, it's only Super Boost worthy but it's something you can go for and the final option is actually nidoqueen nidoqueen could work off the super boost once again and uh, it provides more searchability for pokemon so it means that we can use that brock and those stretchers more um defensively and use stretcher for three targets knowing that nidoqueen can instantly grab that one straight back out the deck and might help us chain attackers a bit more often so the nidoqueen and the greninja those are probably my two favorites right now to be sort of trying to squeeze into the deck um, as tech Pokemon. I could also see the value behind Solgaleo if you are thinking the stall is going to be a thing. So let me know what you think down below. What stage twos are you going to start teching out in this build? But onto the matchup overview. I have put stall as an issue right now because, again, only one switch. Uh, we can't move out of the likes of Meganium or Swampert, so we would end up having to, like, super boost onto it and attack with them, but that just gets removed in a turn. Obviously, they have Faber as well, so they can even Faber away your Charger Bugs and run you out of energy quite easily with Lusamine, which is definitely scary. 
Uh, Baby Blounds feels like it'll be very rough for you because, you know, we're just going to be slower than them as a stage two and, you know, we don't have any hand disruption. We don't play Field Blower. They can go on with their plan A and just keep announcing attacks and win the game pretty easily. Corominable also feels like it's pretty difficult for us because we have to fill our board with Meganiums and Swampurks in order to chain attacks. Maybe we can just have, you know, one Vikavolt active and two Pokemon on our bench. Uh, but even then, the Corominable is getting the job done a lot of the time uh, unless they put Stadium in and can't remove it. So that's something that would be pretty awkward for us. And I also think Whimsicott GX is awkward uh, just because we are... Although we have, you know, the Brock, the two stretchers, the four Lure Ball, we do have a lot of Pokemon recovery, but Lure Ball is never guaranteed. So we have to assume that we'll have to do this, you know, quite a few times to reload. And if you just flip a couple tails, you end up, you know, discarding your Charge Bugs, hoping to get a big knockout. And then you flip tails and nothing happens, which really sucks. So I think that would also be an awkward matchup uh, for this deck overall. But in terms of prize trading on the likes of Zoroark players and against some GX builds, I think you're actually fine. Zapdos feels pretty awkward if they are just going to Grinch down like your Mudkips and your um, Chikoritas before they evolve. But as soon as we get the Herbs going, we're actually pretty tanky on all of our dudes. So it might be awkward for them. It might be one of those moments where they're forced to put the likes of Jolteon and um, Tapu Koko into play. And we can really punish them for that on a prize trade situation. So I think Zapdos is okay. Much better than Baby Blounds. It may end up still being an awkward matchup though. Um, so do bear that in mind. But yeah, I think uh, just a handful of awkward matchups. So keeping this from being a tippy top tier archetype. I think mainly Baby Blacephalon. I think that will be too popular to make Vika Vault top class. But definitely, definitely a very fun road to try out. So those are my closing thoughts. 120 and 220, as we know, are great numbers in the game right now. Uh, decks have been built around less, to be honest, and being able to uh, use this Charger Bug in such an effective manner is so fun to see, and it's really an awesome build to try out, even just for fun. Um, I think a few modifiers here and there may help, especially if tag teams are relevant, or if there are some Stage 2s coming out of the woodwork. Uh, having the likes of that Greninja, or just having in, you know, Raw Choice Bands, Raw uh, Shrine of Punishments for Stadium Removal could be awkward for people to deal with. Um, and yeah, those other stage twos are also worth considering. We have a lot of options when we're playing the game in Swampert, and we've seen builds have all these wacky 101 lines. And especially when we're already playing Gladian, you can try and make it work. Bear in mind, of course, we are quite reliant on guaranteeing a couple charge bugs turn after turn, so it may distract from the overall strategy. Um, but overall, I still think this could be a very fun archetype to try out. Let me know what you guys think down below. Is it going to be more than a rogue? Are there other ways to play this Vika Vault? Did you think about this sort of build at all? Uh, I'd love to hear it all down below because this is very unique and definitely one that's going to be fun. Uh, I think for some early tournaments, if I'm not too worried about um, getting any more points for the season, if I'm not on the 22, on the you know top 22 hunt, I may have to go up to some leagues and challenges and play this deck just for the memes because it seems like it's going to be very different in experience compared to like any other deck you can play right now so let me hear all down below it's been fun guys and i'll be back tomorrow with another unbroken bonds video cheers